Today we are going to discuss Ernest Hemingway's The Old Man in the Sea. For those of you who are in my class, you will be reading this over the next couple days, so this will only be a very short introduction uh, to his work. This is one of my favorite books to read with my incoming uh, freshman students in college, uh, and I it, it's m I do enjoy enjoy Hemingway uh, and a lot of his his books, but this book in particular brings up a lot of very important themes that I think are really important to explore when you are young and in college. Uh, I would put this alongside of a lot of other authors that you should be reading while you're young, um, specifically in college, because when you're in college, you are going to start making friendships that last a lifetime. You are going to start, um, you, you might meet the romantic partner you end up married to uh, for hopefully a long time. Uh, you're going to be choosing careers. Uh, you're going to be choosing majors. You're going to figure out how to internship in these networking decisions. And when you are 18 to 22 years old, uh, a lot of people, unfortunately, they just fall backwards into uh, various roles, uh, careers, jobs, relationships, etc. Uh, the Old Man in the Sea really gets at themes of intentionality, of being mindful of these choices that you're making, uh, of making choices that will make you feel fulfilled and have a purpose and uh, gives you some uh, gives you some direction in life. Uh, so this is one of my uh, favorite books is, uh, to read with, with college students. Um, and so I hope you enjoy it. Again, we're only going to go through some of the brief themes of it because you all will be reading this over the next couple class periods to get into some more of the details uh, about the story. A few things to know about the book. First, it was written by Ernest Hemingway, uh, an American author. Uh, it was written in 1952. Uh, Hemingway wrote several other books. Uh, the Sun Also Rises, um, Farewell to Arms, uh, Snows of Kilimanjaro. Um, uh, there's, there's some more in there that are escaping me. They're over my bookshelf. Uh, but Hemingway was also, um, th he was an adventurous person. He lived a rather uh, chaotic life. Uh, and there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot written about him. Um, but it doesn't take away from the fact that he's an extremely important American writer. Uh, so, The Old Man of the Sea, the story, the plot itself, uh, the main character is a Cuban fisherman named Santiago, and he is uh, struggling to reel in this giant marlin, all right? So, the way this story sort of works out is Santiago, he just has a little dinghy of a boat. He's not a big fisherman, he just sort of goes out, and his whole life is as a fisherman, and he just kind of goes out every few days, tries to gather enough fish to bring back to his little village in Cuba and sell it on the market, and this is what he has done his entire life, right? And the fact that he's getting older in age is very significant sort of to the story as far as, you know, when we're talking about allegories and metaphors and what does this all mean. So for 84 days, for almost three months, he has gone out on his, on his boat and he has caught nothing, right? And for him, he needs to survive, right? So he needs to bring a fish back uh, so that he can, you know, pay his expenses, right? Um, he's not living a big lifestyle. He's just sort of living in a nice little uh, fisherman's shack um, yeah, uh, near the coastline so he can go out every day and, and gather what he needs in order to make a living. He goes out on the 85th day and he catches a giant marlin, right? He hooks a giant marlin. Now, in a little boat like this, uh, you can see this uh, depiction. This is fairly accurate of how big marlins can get. I mean, they're going to get the size of your boat if you're if you're in this sort of like little single sort of dinghy rowboat type of situation here. Um, so you can imagine sort of the struggle that's going to ensue uh, when the marlin is as big as the boat in which you are trying to pull it into. So for two days, the marlin is pulling Santiago further and further and further out to sea. And as it's pulling him out to sea, Santiago starts to have these uh, um, starts to have these thoughts about, you know, I don't know if I'm going to be be able to make it back to the shoreline. How long is this thing going to sort of pull me out to sea? It's a struggle, but he stays with it, right? And this is where his attitude starts to change. His perspective on life starts to change. His perspective about the marlin starts to change. Where no longer is it just a struggle to catch a fish and bring it into work, right? This sort of mundane, I got to go out, I got to catch a fish, I got to bring it back so I can eat and pay my rent, right? You see this attitude change of Santiago, which uh, with regard to why it is that he is willing to continue to be pulled out to sea by this giant fish, even though he knows that this 
could end up in some sort of disastrous death situation for himself. So we can think of uh, how Santiago might feel after two days uh, of being dra dragged out to sea. Um, now he starts to think, well, how does he feel about the Marlin? Well, he actually starts to develop this sort of deep, what Hemingway refers to as a brotherly connection to the Marlin and the Marlin's fight, right? So no longer does he see the Marlin as this sort of beastly opponent uh, that is sort of other from him. He doesn't just go out there and say, I got to catch this fish and bring it back. But he starts to sort of see the marlin as this adversary, right? And he develops this respect for the marlin. Uh, he starts talking about, uh, the book starts to narrate about how uh, Santiago starts to believe that the marlin is too good, right? The, the ethos of the marlin, the essence of the marlin, um, it's too good to be eaten. So Santiago, as he's being pulled out, he's like, this fish is so incredible. It's a, such, such, such a worthy opponent. I don't know if I want to bring it back to land and just allow the villagers to sort of, you know, pay a couple bucks here and there in order to sort of take their portion of fish because they don't understand how important and how heroic in some sense this Marlin is. So he gets into this, uh, you know, interesting existential question of, you know, will the villagers even appreciate something that they don't recognize sort of how much fight is in this creature, right? Do you, are you as, you know, sort of as as a student in my class do you appreciate those things that you don't understand the tough sacrifice that went into sort of creating whatever it is that you're benefiting from the villages are benefiting from consuming the marlin but they don't necessarily understand the struggle that went into capturing this marlin or the fight that the marlin put up in order to avoid being captured all right um and you can say the same thing about you know um some you know contemporary uh things that we think about today right um, do you fully appreciate, you know, the food on your table? Do you fully appreciate the home that you live in? Do you fully appreciate the technology that you use? Um, or do you just sort of take it for granted and you don't sort of understand all the sacrifice that went into giving us the comforts of, you know, a 2020 existence? Um, this quote over here on uh, the left side of the screen for you uh, from Hemingway's Old Man in the City says, but man is not made for defeat. A man can be destroyed, but not defeated. So what he's saying here is Santiago only loses if he gives up, right? So Santiago might be destroyed by being pulled out to sea for two days, right, in this boat. He And by destroyed, I mean absolute death, right? He's going to get pulled out so far, he's not going to be able to make it back. So he might end up dead on this journey. But as long as he stays with the fight, right, he can't be defeated in that regard. All right, so there is this bigger sort of existential sort of like, what are people for? What sort of things should we struggle for and against? Uh, this goes back to some of our discussion when we talked about um, Dostoevsky's Notes from Underground, right? And this idea of, do we just want to live in this utopian existence where everything's just handed to us? Or do we really find meaning and purpose in our life with the struggles and overcoming obstacles? And Hemingway brings up these same points, right? Santiago will not be destroyed, right? Or excuse me, Santiago will not be defeated. He could be destroyed. He could have everything taken away from him. But he's going to keep pushing forward and kind of keep fighting, right? Uh, in order to sort of have this sort of sense of pride in self and, and some sort of satisfaction in life, right? He might lose all material possessions. But at the end of that journey, he says, but I accomplished that thing, whatever it is I set out to accomplish, right? And that's where you get a deep sense of meaning. Um, so we have this sort of uh, metaphor of the marlin. So uh, my my big fish uh, must be somewhere, right? So what does the marlin represent? Well, the marlin represents that sort of big thing that you have in your life that is just slightly beyond obtainable, right? We're not talking about sort of unobtainable goals, unrealistic goals. What we're talking about is you putting yourself in a situation where you see the competition and the competition is just a little bit beyond your capabilities and you're going after it and you're going after it and you're going after it, right? Santiago was a fisherman, so he knows how to capture fish, right? But a marlin that's the size of his boat with the power of that sort of a fish, he doesn't know if he can do it, right? So this sort of marlin is just beyond his capabilities of anything he's ever chased after before. So now I have this question of like, 
you know, what is your Marlin? All right. So wherever you're at in life, um, maybe you are a high school athlete. And I know that that's a tough transition to go from superstar high school athlete into not being an athlete in college. All right. I know what that transition's like. And you're like, where's my competitive edge anymore? Uh, you might have been the A plus student in your class. And now all of a sudden you get to in, in high school and now all of a sudden you're in college and you realize, well, everybody in college is, is the A plus student in their class. Right. There's a reason that some people go to college and some people don't go to college. Um, and so now all of a sudden you have this sort of moment when you realize that, you know, back in high school, I might have been sort of like, you know, big man on campus or the big woman on campus. All of a sudden I get to college and I realize that all of a sudden the, the pond's a lot bigger and there's a whole lot of people who were, you know, the smart kid in their school or the real athletic kid in their school. And now you have to say, okay, what's the next goal I'm going to achieve for myself that just seems just beyond obtainable, all right? So how am I going to push myself to just be unobtainable? So if you're an athlete, maybe say, or if you're athletic and maybe you don't do in sports anymore, you say, maybe say, you know, sign up for a marathon, right? You're like, oh, that seems, that seems too much, but it's just beyond my scope of possibility, right? Or you get into, you know, weightlifting and you just say, I want to lift just beyond what I think I'm capable of lifting. Um, if you're an academic, right? If you're the smart kid in class, right? Maybe you say, okay, I'm going to take that AP class, that advanced class, uh, that's just beyond my capabilities. Right. I want to take the class with that professor that I hear is a tough professor because I want to be challenged just a little bit. I want to try to do a research project or a research paper. I want to try to go to an undergraduate conference and submit research for presentation. All right. So you have to figure out what your Marlin is. OK. Figure out what it is. Right. And then start pursuing it and realize that as you pursue it, that Marlin is going to drag you further and further and further out into the depths of the ocean where you are going to look back and you're not going to be able to see the shoreline and you're like, come hell or high water, like, I got to make this happen because I have no safety net, All right? And that's what Hemingway's talking about with regard to this Marlin, right? It's something that you're so convinced that it's yours, that you're willing to go just beyond your capabilities to where there's no other option except to succeed at that thing. Santiago makes a decision. He says, I'm going to get this Marlin, even if it drags me to my death. All right. Now we have this question about when is the best time to go after your Marlin, right? And again, we're talking metaphorically here. So one thing that I like that uh, Hemingway does in this um, in, the, in this short uh, in this short read is that Santiago is older, all right? And as we all get older, right, or as we get beyond whatever age we were supposed to be when we were sort of accomplished that thing that we you know were meant to accomplish. We start to look back and say, like, do I have one more fight in me? Do I have the capability to sort of accomplish one more thing? All right. So Santiago's older and he just kind of wants to quietly sort of live his life and sort of, you know, fall back into his home. And he knows he's, you know, going to going to die soon just because he's older. Right. But what he says is, I want one more fight in me. I want one more big fishing expedition in me. So for you, you have to say, OK, what is your Marlin, and then when's the best time to go after it? And the best time to go after your Marlin is today, is right now, all right? And the reason it's right now is because you might not know how much time you have, right? So one of the things that frustrates me with people in general, but specifically students, since I am in the classroom with so many of you, is when students say something like, I want to I wanna read all these great books, but I'll start next week, right? Or I'll start next month. And one of the problems with that attitude, especially, you know, if we're, let's just use, you know, you have a goal to read, you know, the classics, you know, during your time in college. The problem with that is eventually you're going to sort of run up towards graduation date and you're going to realize I haven't started working on my goal yet. And I don't have that much time to accomplish my goal because I can't read 100 classic books during the last week of my college experience. So the best time to sort of start on whatever goal it is you have is today. So let's say your goal is to run a marathon, 26.2 miles. You're not going to be able to just do that in a year from now without any training. But today, you can go run one mile, right? Or maybe you just walk one mile. And then within a couple weeks, all of a sudden, you're running two miles. And then you're running three miles, right? And then within a year from now, now you've sort of gotten to that goal of being able to run 26.2 miles when you apply for a marathon, okay? So the best time to start going after your goals is today, right now, because your goal should be just beyond the scope of obtainable 
where you are going to need a lot of time and a lot of practice and, a, and a, a, yeah, a lot of practice in order to make sure that it is obtainable, you know, when it's time to, when, when it's time uh, that, uh, when, when that opportunity presents itself. All right. So figure out a way to go after your goal now. So another goal that students have said is they want to travel. Great. You want to travel through Europe. Fine. The problem is if you say I'm going to travel through Europe next summer and I'm not going to do anything till next summer is you might not have the funds, right? You might not have it mapped out. Right? You might not have found the right people to travel with if you want to travel with some friends. So if you're going to travel through Europe next summer, that's going to take some planning. So today, what you can do is you can take $10 from your next paycheck and put it into a separate savings account. Right? And you're like, this is my European vacation fund All right? or whatever it is. So the best time to always go after your goals is right now today. Let's say you have a goal to read War and Peace. Right? Go check out that book from the library today. You don't have to read it all today. It's like you should be taking small steps towards accomplishing your goals every day. We have this concept known as memento mori. All right. So it's this ancient concept um, comes out of, you know, Greek and Roman times. But memento mori means this, right? Memento, right? Uh, remember, right? Memory, right? And mori, which means death. So like mortician or mortuary, right? Moratorium, right? To stop. Okay. So memento mori, remember that you will die. Now, it seems like a very morbid concept. Uh, morbid, another word out of, out of Mori, right? It seems like this sort of morbid concept. However, it was used as a way to constantly remind people to sort of get out of bed, right? And do the things that you are supposed to do. Like, what were you put on this earth to do? Um, in the 2020 context, you might think of things like Netflix and social media. If you see yourself just constantly watching Netflix during this whole pandemic thing, right? At some point, think of Memento Mori and think, was that, is that what I was put here to do on this earth? To sort of accumulate the most amount of time spent on Netflix or accumulate the most amount of time spent on my iPhone or to, um, you know, the whole host of other things that we all do uh, that, that leads to wasted time at some point. So Memento Mori just reminds us that there are things that we need to accomplish in life. We don't know when we're going to die. So the fact of the matter is we should be taking care of those things right now. All right. Uh, so some of the imagery in the picture above you, you're going to see this in a lot of, of artwork right now that you go around museums. You'll probably see these symbols and this is where they all come from. Um, so you have a, uh, uh, an hourglass that's right above my head. Um, you have this skull, obviously. Um, there's a timepiece that is hanging out over here, but it's covered up. Uh, by uh, by this uh, ribbon, um, you have some you know playing cards. Obviously, you have a, a a candle that the flame has been burned out, right? Good symbolism there. Um, you have bubbles. I don't really think that's part of like ancient art, but um, yeah, you have some bubbles over here. Obviously, bubbles they come and go. Uh, so it's usually a skull, an hourglass, and the third one is usually um, flowers or tulips. Um, to sort of to remind us that it's like yeah, fresh flowers are great today, but we know that within a few days they're gonna die. So to put these sort of things um, on your desk or in your room was a very common practice against a lot of philosophers. Uh, I'm sure there's still some philosophers who do it, but um, it was just a constant reminder of, of people who were sort of practicing this idea of memento mori. I'm going to put a skull on my desk. I'm going to put an hourglass on my desk. I'm going to put some uh, flowers on my desk just to constantly remind me that like time it's it, it keeps going forward it does not care like it's going to go forward and it's going to get a lot faster the older you get it's going to move a lot quicker all right um so this is that concept right remember you're going to die and if you remember you're going to die right not in a morbid sense but you remember you're going to die you realize like oh today i better do that thing that it is i want to do but first i got to figure out what's my marlin first i got to figure out what is that thing that i do want to do right so this goes back to some of our other discussions with like, you just got to figure it out. All right. You have to figure out what it is that's important to you um, sort of in the quiet moments of your life. Um, I did a um, PowerPoint. I'll go ahead and put it down the, uh, in, the, in the notes uh, with regard to uh, intrapersonal communication. This was from my CAS 203 class uh, where we talk a little bit about this concept of sort of know thyself, talk a little bit about Oedipus and the Roman god Janus and Fight Club and um swan lake and black swan and uh, a few other a few other ideas where it's just like figure out who you are know who you are know yourself right um figure out what your goals are and as soon as you know what your goals are then every day it becomes easier to say hey 
why am I on my phone so much or why am I watching Netflix so much when instead I should be going after my goals? But the first thing you got to do is you got to figure out what those goals are. Uh, this is usually the point in the classroom when we're in person where I sh would, would show you uh, this poem uh, uh, being recited on, on YouTube by, you know, some you know, famous actor or voice actor or what have you. Uh, but there was this poet, um, and unfortunately he passed away in his, uh, in his 30s. Uh, but his name was Dylan Thomas, and he writes this poem called Do Not Go Gentle Into That Good Night. You have probably heard pieces of this poem. It's been um, redone a lot in different movies, or it's probably been on different commercials too. All right. Uh, but Thomas has this idea, right, throughout this poem. And you can, um, I'll put a YouTube link to one of the, one of the, um, somebody, somebody reciting this poem um, down below. But you can listen to the whole thing. It's not very long, right? But here's one of the stanzas out of it where he says, Do not go gentle into that good night. Old age should burn and rave at the close of day. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. What he's saying is, you know, the good night is, you know, death, right? So this sort of like peaceful sleep, you know, RIP kind of stuff. What Dylan Thomas says is like, don't just sit back, right? Santiago had a choice. He could have said like, you know what? I'm going to cut this fish loose and just let it go. And I'll kind of float back. I'll try again tomorrow, right? Um, but Santiago, like there's something in him that's like, I'm going to rage against, like this, this might be my last hurrah. This might be my last chance to do something big and exciting and to sort of test myself one more time. Um, you see this in a lot of uh, different sports movies, right? It's like the guy who wants like one more shot. He's like, he retires and he comes out of retirement because he wants to do it one more time. Um, and this is what Dylan Thomas is writing. And again, Dylan Thomas, you know, unfortunately died in his, in his 30s here. Um, but this is this concept of, you know, just remembering you're going to die. Um, it's inevitable for all of us. But while you're alive, it's like keep living. Right. Don't just sort of be reserved to say I'm going to retire and then just sort of retire nice and quiet. Um, you know, don't be that person who says, oh, I can't wait till I graduate college. Right. Um, this is one thing I go through some of my students with. Don't be that student who when you were 15, say, I can't wait till I'm 16. And then when you're 16, say, I can't wait till I'm 18 so I can be an adult. When you're eight, I can't wait till I'm 21 so I can drink. And then you're 21, you're like, I can't wait till I'm 22 so I graduate college. And you're 22, and you're like, well, I can't wait till I'm 30 so I have a stable job and I'm making more money. Then all of a sudden you hit 30 and people are like, oh, I'm looking forward to counting the days to retirement, right? All you're doing with those little gaps is constantly remind or constantly like pushing yourself ahead, like closer to the finish line, right? There's no reason to like rush ahead in life into this like oh now i'm finally going to be at peace it's like no like every day you should wake up full of vigor and say you know what i'm going to be 21 one day and i'm going to be able to order alcohol and that's great but it's like right now you're not so it's like enjoy the time when you're 19. like whatever 19 has to has to offer you like just go after it with a lot of vigor all right And finally, uh, a little quick summary on Hemingway. And again, I didn't get a lot into Old Man in the Sea, uh, just a couple quick themes uh, because you all are gonna be reading it and we'll discuss it in class over the next two days. Um, and then it'll sort of, hopefully some of these ideas will feed into and inspire you on your presentations that'll be um, upcoming, all right? So uh, Hemingway uh, took his own life um, in his early 60s, as you see here. Uh, and his life was very adventurous. Again, it, it, his his, work and his life and his personality is still debated in literary circles um but there's no doubt that his life was adventurous he just kept going and chasing after adventure after excitement all right uh so just a quick little timeline about him like he's from illinois but he also spent time in africa this is where he wrote like the the um the um snows of kilimanjaro um, he spent time in, in, in Spain uh, with uh, The Sun Also Rises. He lived in Cuba. He lived in Florida. He lived in Idaho. He was married four times. Um, I, that probably gets categorized as adventurous. I don't recommend that you get married multiple times. You know, like try to get married once and, and make it work. And you can uh, hang out in my 203 class when we talk about romantic relationships if you want to know more about, you know, how to try to be more successful in them. All right. Um, but the themes of all of his books are ideas about adventure, right? They all take place, not all of them, but they just, they take place on, on, on different continents, during, you know, for different reasons, you know, books about war and fishing and 
um, bullfighting, and uh, it's all over the place, right? But it's just exciting. It's moving, it's moving, it's moving, it's action. Um, his work, he definitely known for his discussions on just manhood in general. Um, in his later writings, he does get into some themes of like emasculation, right? Specifically when it comes to old age. So as you get older, it's like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm not as, I'm, I don't have as much energy. You know, my testosterone's dropping off. You know, I can't lift heavy things anymore. Um, I can't, you know, pick up, you know, I can't pick up like, you know, I can't go out to the bars and like pick up women, you know, like I used to, right? As far as, you know, the way that he's writing into his 50s and 60s, all right? But he does have a lot of conversation about sex and love and booze and debauchery and decadence and just sort of like this overabundance, like thirst and zeal for life and trying to get as much out of it as he can. So there's like two questions um, to, to, to ask here, right? So the first is like, what is a quote unquote authentic life? So people talk about, you know, you, you know, live a life that's real and authentic. The problem with that question is that everybody might have a different answer. So because everyone has a different answer, this is your assignment, right? Your assignment is to say, okay, well, what is your authentic life? All right. So you get to have, you know, the life that you want. Um, and that's great. Okay. But you gotta, you gotta go back to this idea of a Marlin. It's like, what is that Marlin that you want? What is it that you're seeking after? All right. Too many people go through life and they say, I'm just going to graduate college and I'm going to get a job and I'm going to have a family. All right. And those are all good things to pursue, but they're not specific. All right. Because there's jobs that you could have, that I could give you that you would hate. There are families that I could, you know, give you and then you would not want to be a part of that family. All right. So you need to be very specific about why is it you want a family? What do you want out of your family? What, how do you envision your family? What job do you want? What's going to make you feel fulfilled? Right. When people say like, I want to make a lot of money. Um, well, how much is a lot of money? Is fifty thousand dollars a year? That'll that'll that's survivable. You can live off fifty thousand dollars a year, but you might not think that's enough. You might say, no, I want to make a million dollars a year, All right? So you just got to get specific with regard to what do you mean when you say I want an authentic life? All right. So what is your authentic life? Same thing is true with the Marlin. Go on any adventure you want, but I need to know what the adventure is. All right. Go out there, you know, challenge yourself. Try to obtain goals that are just beyond obtainable, where you get swept out in the sea f further than you're comfortable with, but that goal is so important, you're kind of willing to go after it, right? Because you are not going down, all right? Um, so that's what we have here with Hemingway. Um, you know, again, he did he did commit suicide in his early 60s. I think this probably ties in, you know, to uh, psychoanalyze a little bit, which I try to avoid because I have no idea what was going on in his head, even though, you know, lots of people speculate. But yeah, I mean, you get in these questions of, of manhood and masculinity, right? Um, once you hit 60, especially back in the 1960s, um, old age was a lot different than old age now, right? Old age now, it's like, you know, there's people in their 70s who are running around and they're super fit. You know, you make it to 60 back in the 1960s, um, you're, you know, you're, you're getting up there, all right? So life's getting a little bit harder. And my guess is that um, Hemingway did, just didn't feel like he just, he was probably getting... Uh, I don't want to use the word depressed. He was probably getting um, frustrated, we'll say, um, that that he just wasn't, that he just couldn't do what he had done his entire life. And again, it's sort of like running around and um, living a big life um, and going on these adventures. And he, he was probably getting worn down. And that's probably kind of where he ended up in the end, unfortunately. All right. But there's a lot we can learn. All right. Uh, from the old man in the sea. I hope you all enjoy the read. Read it, enjoy it. Uh, I look forward to our discussion uh, over the next two class periods. And again, um, I'll put some links down here. Listen to uh, Dylan Thomas. Um, Do not go gentle into that good night. And uh, I'll leave a couple other links for you. All right, see you later.